The BBC presents My Word. And here to introduce the programme and the panel is Jack Longland. My Word is a word game played by people whose business is words, and those taking part are Anne Scott James, Dennis Norden, Dillis Powell and Frank Muir. <laughs> Round one tries to test their respective vocabularies, Two marks if they get the answers of right. We begin with Anne Scott James. Anne, what is hydrolysis? H y d r o l y s i s. Hydrolysis. Well, something to do with water. Yes, that's fair enough. Now, electrolysis is some sort of curing by electricity. I think it's some sort of water cure. No, it wouldn't cure you. It wouldn't cure you. No, uh, it's some kind of scientific process. And well, water and chemistry, you put those things together, uh, give you one and a half, which is fairly generous, I think. Hydrolysis is the chemical decomposition of a compound by reaction with water, and the water, in case anybody's interested, also gets decomposed. Uh, mm. Fankner, yeah, what is a gaydoid? Gaydoid. It's the opposite of a saddoid. <laughs> <laughs> It's a piece of, surely it's a piece of, um, of, uh, Maria Martinui, <laughs> or, uh, Sweeney Toddum. It's, uh, gayed, or he'd like to get my hands on that maid. <laughs> <laughs> no. Gaydoid is a creature. Yes, creature. They're all, uh, alloids are creatures, aren't they? Yes, that's right, it is a creature. Water, it's a water yes. creature. <laughs> so it's, a, uh, a. Uh. What? <laughs> Uh, it's uh, water. It's a fish. Yes, a fish. <laughs> <laughs> and a well-deserved half mark. <laughs> a gaydoid is a fish of the cod family. Dennis Power, what is a champagne? C h a m p a i g n. Kind of open air piece of ground. Kind of thing that Agincourt was fought over. I'll do. <laughs> Two marks. <laughs> Champagne, in this sense, unlike Verve Clicker, is an expanse of open country. In fact, it comes straight from the Italian Campania. Dennis Norton, what's the meaning of noctivagus? Well, that's a compound of nocturnal and vagrant. I would yes. Yes. I would say that if you, if you booked into um, a strange hotel and you neglected to find out exactly where the bathroom was situated, <laughs> you would find yourself noctivagus, yes. which <laughs> would be wandering round at night. You're absolutely right, then. This couldn't be better. Right. That's the perfect definition. Two marks. <laughs> well, before we begin round two, I give each team a quotation for them to write down, and I hope that the two women members team will go on studying those quotations because at the end I shall ask them where the quotations come from. The one for Anne Scott James and Dennis Norton is Forever Amber and Dillis Powell and Frank yours is My Love is Like a Red Red Rose. And then at the end of the program I shall ask Dennis and Frank to give me their idea of how these came to be said or written. Well, then we have a round of origins and derivations of uh, words and expressions and phrases and three marks if members of the team can first of all give me the present meanings and then the derivation. <coughs> Beginning again with Anne Scott James and the phrase to run riot. Well to run riot just means to go berserk, mm -hmm. go mad, nuts, create trouble and confusion. Yes and by origin? <coughs> Oh, mm. you You've got to think about jorocks. Hunting. Ah, oh, it's a hunting word. Oh, it's right. what the hounds do when they're not behaving themselves properly. Yes, they're not, why aren't they behaving themselves? Because they are not 
coming to heel, keeping to the scent, yes. yoiksing, tally-hoeing. They are just going all over the woods like <laughs> that. <laughs> yeah, all right. Two and a half out of three. I did some help there. Um, present, run right, means acting or even to talk without any kind of control, a very disorderly way and very, very wildly. But it is a hunting term. When the hounds had lost the scent, they then may lose their sense of direction and go all over the place running riot and following any kind of scent indiscriminately. That's jolly hard for the huntsman. Two and a half. Frank Muir, spit on it for luck. <laughs> spit on what for luck? <laughs> That's what you've got to find out. <laughs> oh, it's, it's just a, a, a gesture of, um, of old-fashioned belief that the devil is lurking at hand, ready to snatch you. And uh, spitting on something of your own is uh, propitiates the devil. Yes. You spit on, on your hands yes. before digging, but that's for practical purposes, because it yeah. tends to prevent blisters. Yeah, that'll do, Frank. That's three, I think. You spit. Oh. Um, expression spit on it for luck, still used, I think, by country people, and I believe by people in London. But it goes right back to Greek and Roman time. Pliny said, it averts witchcraft and availed in giving the enemy a shrewder blow if you spat on fist or on weapon first. And people do still spit on money to bring them luck. Boxers spit on their hands. And it's said that costermongers spit on the first money that they receive during the day. But Frank, I think, is quite right because there is a perfectly practical origin behind this. And those of you who may have read The Naked Ape will realize what it is, that if you are girded up for action, your palms tend to sweat. And if they don't sweat in time, as when a woodman is using an axe, it's not a bad thing to assist the process of sweating first. Three marks. Dillis Powell, subpena. Um, subpena means when you're waiting to be called as a witness, I thought, doesn't it? So you have to be a witness. When you have, yes, you have to be, you're, you're compelled to be a witness. Yes, and but what is the thing is, that makes you go as a witness? Well, you're under a penalty. Yes, that's perfectly true, but uh, how do you know? How do you know? Mm. Well, you know if you didn't go. Yes, but how do you well, know? Oh, go. I see. Oh, you're fine. Mm -hmm. Yes, all right, you've got the three marks. <laughs> Sorry. What I was trying to get exactly was a subpoena is a writ commanding somebody to appear in a court of justice, often very unwillingly, to bear witness or to give evidence in a particular case. And as Dillis implied, it's called subpoena, two Latin words, because these are the beginning of the writ, subpoena centum librorum, which means under penalty of having to pay a hundred pounds. <coughs> Three marks. Dennis Norton, bald as a coot, or silly old coot. Well, it means you're very bald or very silly. Yes. Well, a coot is, um, is a bird which hangs around brooks. Yes. I come from haunt of coot and turn. <laughs> um, I only, can only presume that a coot is both bald and silly. <laughs> well, that's not at all a bad shot. Um, I'll give you <laughs> two out of three. Um, quite common expressions, although they come from America originally. The so-called bald coot is called bald, not because it is, but it has a very odd kind of bill or beak, which goes right back, grows back right towards the middle of the forehead, and then uh, forms a kind of bone shield. And from a distance, this poor old coot does look quite bald. In fact, it is not. And silly old coot, or daft as a coot, comes from American hunters, who had at any rate the impression that a coot used to put its head into mud or water because, poor thing, it thought that if it couldn't see itself, you couldn't see it either. But I don't think ornithologists would think that was a very good explanation. Two marks. Well, then we have a round of who, why, and what questions. Two marks, again, for correct answers. And Scott James, who wrote a historical novel called The Last of the Barons, and who was the character referred to in the title? Well, it was written by Lord Lytton. Yes. Who was the character? He made kings. Oh, yeah. Warwick. The, the Earl of Warwick. <laughs> <laughs> right. Buller Lytton, um, who at one time, which I never knew before, was Secretary of the State for the Colonies, 
but was otherwise a novelist, wrote a number of historical novels, including The Last Days of Pompeii, and this was one he wrote about Warwick the Kingmaker, uh, dealing with the Wars of the Roses. <clears throat> Frank Muir, what do you know about Hellfire Clubs? I know something about a Hellfire Club. That'll do. I presume the others were named after that one. Yes. Well, there's this chap, you see, Sir Francis Dashwood, who's a bit before 1760, but not all that much, who did the Grand Tour and had a bit of religious mania, actually, in Rome. I think it was Rome or Florence, and went altogether to the reverse and rushed back to England and bought uh, Medmenum, Ab Medmenum Abbey on the banks of the Thames, where it still is, or ruined, but though, <coughs> albeit, and set up there this tremendous uh, orgy club for holding um, unimaginable goings-on. <laughs> and it was called the club because it was a kind of club, and they, they all dressed up as monks, so it was all mixed up with uh, sacrilegious goings-on as well. Yes, that's quite right. I've got absolutely nothing to add, except that the, they were also known as the Franciscans. This was the point Frank was making. Um, an, an <laughs> unwarrantable affront, not on Frank, but on the Francis, Franciscan order, of course. All right, Dillis Powell. The origins of Jocasta and the famished cat and of the crime of Sylvester Bonnard were both found in France. But which France? And in what sense wasn't it the true France? And what were they anyway? <laughs> and who okay. we'll Take the seventh question first. <laughs> <laughs> the, the crime of Sylvester Bonnard was, was a, a novel or story by Anatole France. Yes, that's quite right. And... The other one, too? The other one, too. Yes. But in what sense wasn't it the true France? Not the true France. All right, one and a half. Um, these were books of stories or successful novels, late 19th century, by Anatole France. And, of course, they were written in French and in France. But uh, Anatole France was only a pseudonym of a chap called Jacques Anatole Thibault. So, in that sense, it wasn't the real France. Dennis Norton, what's the difference between a masculine rhyme and a feminine rhyme? And if you'd like to submit me a coloured diagram afterwards, I don't mind. Feminine rhyme tends to be cleaner. <laughs> <laughs> but in the strict sense... Oh, no. I'll give you an example, I think. A oh, minute, no. just let me hastily... Yes. Ogden Nash wrote... The turtle lives twixt plated decks, which practically conceal its sex. Now, decks and sex is a masculine rhyme because yes. it's monosyllabic. Yes. And it goes on, I think it clever of the turtle in such a fix to be so fertile. Yes. <laughs> now, turtle and fertile are feminine rhymes because the last syllable doesn't rhyme. The actual rhyme comes before the last syllable. Well done, Dennis. Oh, and again. Really <laughs> well what sex is oh. the turtle? <laughs> also known as strong rhymes and weak rhymes, yes, unless you're writing them, because it's the weak rhymes which are the most difficult to do. <laughs> well, we give Dennis two and a half again, both because he knew absolutely everything about it and also for such an admirable example. In other words, uh, where the rhyme falls on the last syllable of the line, which is stress, that's masculine. The feminine rhyme, it's where the unstressed syllable comes last of all, and it's the stressed one just before it. If he were fatter, it would be no matter. That's a feminine one. And we come to the last round and go back to those quotations I gave the two teams earlier in the programme. The two marks and Scott James, can you give me the origin of your quotation? Forever Amber. Well, it was the title of a novel which was people always used to keep in a brown paper cover. <laughs> 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 Tucked in the shelf behind the Dickens is by Kathleen Windsor. Yes, two marks it is. Kathleen Windsor's historical, or I think historical, novel, uh, Forever Amber. Dennis Powell, the origin of your quotation, My love is like a red, red rose. It's the first line of a poem by Burns. Yep, two marks. And I'm going to ask Dennis and Frank to give me their explanation of how these quotations came into being. 
And on this occasion, the marks will go to whichever incredible explanation gets the longer applause from the audience here in the theatre. Uh, so first of all, back to Dennis Norden and his quotation, Forever Amber. As a fil film writer, I can reveal to you that only once have I had an idea for a film that really fired me. It was a different type of war film, because it's a war film that takes place in peacetime. <laughs> you see, every war film has the same sort of story. It's about a, a company of marines or an army platoon or a squadron in the Air Force, a group of individuals who, under the stress of combat and danger, are finally welded into one disciplined unit. You see, and that's the appeal of it. And they've never been able to transfer this to peacetime because they've never been able to find a similar group under similar stress. But I have a formation dancing team. <laughs> <laughs> and, and my idea is to present the story of a formation dancing team in the terms of a war film. So you start off 20 years back, you see, and there they are, Mrs. Eva Swathney's formation dancing team. Nine men, nine women. <laughs> and there, in front of them, and you hear very faintly the damn buster's cha-cha, is, is the skipper, Mrs. Eva Swathney. And she says, I'm going to make dancers out of you if it takes five years. And we see them follow him in the training, you know, mile after mile, in strict foxtrot tempo, you know, with 250 yards of sequins on their back, and, and all the, the, the hazards, that they, the pitiful short, shortage of equipment. The girls haven't got enough material to make their frocks. All right, one of them says, give us the tool and we will finish the job. <laughs> and, and then you, you, you take them... You take them into their first campaign. We see their reverses. And not only their reverses, we see their chassis turns <laughs> and their scissors step. And then finally, when they're all welded together into one disciplined dancing team, the big moment, they meet the Germans. It's the Eurovision professional <laughs> dancing <laughs> tournament, you see, and the, the, the tenseness of the waiting beforehand in the dressing room. And finally, we come into the closing moments, the Latin American section, and suddenly the murmur goes round. Mrs. Eva Swathney has slipped on an orange-age straw. <laughs> Eva's bought it. Comes and for a moment, they, they falter. That great heart that led them has stopped. She's in the great palais in the sky <laughs> and then, uh, then our, our hero he rallies them he says all right chaps let's get this one for the skipper and they sweep in and they win the whole of the latin american section i i think you know and i'm not i say this in all modesty that this is going to make <laughs> all quiet in the western front look like mary poppins <laughs> and all I'm held up for at the moment, apart from the fact that everybody thinks it's rotten, it <laughs> is a title. And, you know, I've thought of, considered the 39 steps <laughs> in which we swerve. Um, but I think I've got it. One that captures the mood of that last tense screen classic, that last Latin American moment. Watch for it when it comes round to your cinemas, because it's our hero's rallying cry. For Eva, Samba. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm terribly grateful to Dennis. I've always wanted to know what formation dancing was, and now I do. Well, now we go back to Frank Muir, and if you remember, his quotation was, my love is like a red, red rose. 
Um, Jimmy Young, the disc jockey, are you listening? Because this story I'm telling is, is, is really for you. Um, I must explain that Jimmy Young has a, a radio program, a sort of disc jockey program, and they also give recipes. <laughs> I've always been fascinated about these recipes, and he, he gives a recipe and asks uh, listeners to please tell him how they've turned out. Well, I tried one, you see, so, Jimmy, if you're listening, I, I thought you'd like to know how it turned out. It was, as I recall, two, he most insistent on this, two pounds of plain flour. Now, fortunately, I live near the airport, so I was able to um, <laughs> go along there on my way home. Do you know that they don't actually bake in the aircraft? <laughs> you know those stone-cold sandwiches you get sometimes? But they're not actually made in the aircraft. They're, they're made outside and brought in. So I bought some stuff called self-raising flour, which is obviously plain self-raising, it's the same kind of thing. <laughs> and there was a pint of water. That was a bit difficult. I, all I got was a quart bottle. So I, I very cleverly went to the pub and asked for a pint of beer. I drank that and asked if he'd fill it up with water so that I could wash the glass for him. And I secretly poured that into the quart bottle. It came about halfway up. Um, <coughs> Then uh, he said, salt, salt, a pinch. Well, that was easy because the window next door was open. <laughs> and was the kitchen window. And uh, a lump of yeast, which he said you can get from any baker. Now, I asked any baker. <laughs> he actually repairs bicycles. I don't know why Jimmy Young thinks he keeps yeast and asked him for yeast. He hadn't got any, but I did get some from a cake shop. It, it's sort of yellow dough and stinks. And... <laughs> I put all the ingredients in the bowl and it said um, mix them all together, pour in the water and uh, knead for 20 minutes. <laughs> now, a couple of hints here. <laughs> Roll your trousers up first. <laughs> um, or if, if you started a job and forgotten to roll your trousers up, if you can't get the dough off with... <laughs> with hot water or petrol, quite a good tip is to burn the trousers. <laughs> I needed it. I needed it for the 20 minutes. He then said, find a warm place, about 80 degrees, and put the bowl in to prove it. Um, I shoved the bowl. I didn't seem to prove anything to me, so I took it out again. Well, it was 80 or 20. I, I, I stared at it. It didn't do anything. <laughs> better just sat there looking at me so I whipped it out again it then said um, grease a tin well no problem there out the garage back <laughs> and, um, put the batter in press it firmly and uh, bake in a low oven for about four hours <laughs> bit of a problem here but luckily the stove has legs hacksaw <laughs> uh, in quarter of an hour oven quite low, touching the floor, actually, and baked it for four hours. Well, I took it out, Jimmy, and it didn't look very prepossessing, and I couldn't get it out of the tin. It was a sort of darkish, hard-looking thing. So I inserted a knife down the side of the tin and put all my pressure on the end of the knife, and the loaf disappeared. I couldn't find it anywhere. I searched around, it wasn't in it. But the following morning, I found it was on the ceiling, <coughs> where it had sort of broken the crust and the dough stuff had started to drop and it congealed into a sort of upside-down, horrible, strange pyramid. Rather like those plaster ceiling fixtures that used to, used to have uh, flecks uh, with a lamp. And that was uh, the result of my thing. So, Jimmy, if you're worrying how my uh, loaf-making turned out, all I can say is uh, my loaf is like a weird, weird rose. <laughs> By your vote, very, very, very close indeed, Frank wins the contest of the two stories, and so far as the contest as a whole is concerned, this means a win for <coughs> Dillis Powell and Frank Muir by two marks, and that also brings to an end this edition of My Word.
in My Word, you heard Gillis Powell, Anne Scott James, Frank Muir and Dennis Norton, introduced by Jack Longland. The program was devised by Tony Shryan and Edward J. Mason and presented by the BBC. BBC presents My Word. And here to introduce the programme and the panel is Jack Longland. My Word is a word game played by people whose business is words, and those taking part are Dillis Powell, Frank Muir, Anne Scott James, and Dennis Norton. Round one tries to test their respective vocabularies. Two marks if they get the meaning of these words roughly right. Beginning with Dillis Powell. Dillis, what's the meaning of equivorous? Something to do with eating. Yes. Um, I don't think I do it myself. It's eating horses. Horse. <laughs> yes, you're dead right. <laughs> Probably have done. <laughs> Eat? <laughs> eating horse flesh, which a few people had to do during the war. All right, Dennis Norton. Dennis, what's an erg? E R G. <laughs> um, it's not what uh, happiness is shaped like. Um, <laughs> I know it. It's something to do with physics. Yes. But I think that when they did erg in physics, I had my tonsillitis. Then I. And I had my heat bumps. <laughs> and then I got interested in girls, so I, I missed herbs <laughs> altogether. I went straight to heat, light and sound. Um, it's something you in physics. Um, <laughs> One out of two. <laughs> it's a unit of work or energy in physics. Dennis got that bit right. It's the work done by a unit force of one dyne on a body which moves one centimetre in the direction of action of the force. That Why takes didn't a bit you of know that? I don't know. <laughs> I didn't know, even know where the action was. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anne Scott James. Anne, what is a moiety? M-O-I-E-T-Y, moiety. What it means, a part or half, I think. Mm-hmm. And in what sort of... A fine old Frenchy word, I would think. Yeah. I give you a moiety of my inheritance. That's right. That's what Farlet. I mean. Two marks it is. Mm. Frank Muir, what is... Teramycin. It's stuff that you get given on a spoon. <laughs> Thick and very often pink. <laughs> when you're lying inert and steaming like a pudding. <laughs> it's an antibiotic. That's it. But it is produced from one of the soil funguses, <clears throat> and it's uh, very like mycelium, the spawn of fungi. It comes from a Greek word meaning mushroom. I hope it isn't mushrooms, but it's something rather similar. Well, before we begin round two, I give each team a quotation for them to write down, and the two women members of each team will, I hope, go on studying those quotations, because at the end of the programme, I shall ask them where the quotations come from. Dillis Powell and Frank Muir, your quotation is, none were for the party, all were for the state. And uh, Anne with uh, Dennis Norton, yours is, a thing of beauty is a joy forever, its loveliness increases. And then at the end of the programme, I shall ask Frank and Dennis to give me their idea of how these came to be said or written. The next round is about origins and derivations of words and expressions and phrases, and three marks are available if team members can give me, first of all, the present meaning, and then the origin and derivation. Dillis Powell, bullion, B-U-L-L-I-O-N, bullion. 
Well, now it means um, sort of gold, does it? I mean gold. Yes, that'll do. The origin? Well, origin. Hmm? Bullion. No, it's, it's no wheel. No, sorry, I've given it your word. Difficult. Soup? Yeah. Soup? Mm -hmm. Now, In think, the... think oh. about that. Gold, my doors, no, it's Spanish. Oh. Well, if we had a set of gold and my doors and you wanted bullion, what would you do? You'd... Uh, Melt them. Mm -hmm. In a knife to the burning that. pestle of mortar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, two out of three, a considerable amount of help there. Uh, bullion normally means gold or silver in the mass, um, but usually rendered molten and then um, made into ingots, as distinct from gold in coins or ornaments and things like that. And it is a corruption of the French word bouillon, which just means boiling or a form of soup, so that you boiled up the gold in whatever shape it was before and arrived at this thing which cooled down into an ingot. Dennis Norden, balmy. Choose your spelling. Yeah. B-A-R-M-Y. I prefer. Oh, well, that means uh, round the twist or <laughs> yes. something like that. Why does it mean round the twist? Well, I should think it's from confusion with the other word, balmy, B-A-L-M-Y, mm -hmm. which means a soft breeze. <laughs> this is so soft <laughs> would be balmy. This is ingenious, Dennis. But well, I, don't they, they, I think it's I think the man ingenious. <laughs> it has every signs of being correct. Yeah. If I remember. <laughs> <laughs> Stick to it. I'll give you one and a half out of three. Right, yeah. <laughs> Tight. Um, Not... As Dennis said, it means somebody who's terribly eccentric or even crazy or <clears> daft. <throat> but it comes from the word B-A-R-M, balm, which is the froth on fermenting malt liquor or yeast on the way to making up beer and balmy therefore means full of balm frothy bubbling over empty-headed and so on and that's how the word balmy came to mean pretty crazy and scott james <coughs> the phrase that's his blind spot well it means that's the thing which he refuses to see mm -hmm. um origin Oh, I should think you've just got a... No, is it? No, it's not a fault in the eye, I don't yes. think. Is it? Just simply Te sort of... Technically, like... yes. Oh, I thought it was probably something more complicated than that. What just means is a bit... The pupil at that point has uh, its convex instead of concave curves, or the other way around. Of... So there's a little bit where it doesn't see. Yes, you're the right. The lens I, of the eye I, is I shouldn't go on elaborating, because you'll get it wrong, but I... <laughs> 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 I'll give you a three marks. Um, blind spot means this is a subject uh, in which somebody's usual sound judgment or knowledge is completely lacking. But it comes from the fact that everybody does, in fact, literally have a blind spot, which is on the retina of the eye, just where the optic nerve comes onto the retina. And that particular bit of the retina isn't sensitive to light at all. It is a quite literal blind spot. But I think you get a three. Frank Muir, here comes the sand man. <laughs> Here comes the sermon. In adult language, it's um, time for Betty Buys. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it means um, time to go to bed. Yes, why? Well, it's one of these children's things, isn't it? That during the night, um, a, a sandman comes and sprinkles your retinas, <laughs> concave and convex, with sand. <laughs> This is why when you wake up, you only have to wipe those gritty bits from inside the <laughs> corner of the eye. <laughs> That's just about near enough. I think it's slightly generous, but I'll give you all three marks. Um, it does mean, here comes the salmon, it's time for the little children to go to bed. But it is a reference to the fact that often little children, when they get sleepy, will rub their eyes with their knuckles, as though they've got something in both eyes. And that is because it, tiredness, which is called is causing their eyes to become a bit oversensitive, and so some brilliant adult invented Here Comes the Sandman, because the effect is very much as though you had sand or grit in your eyes. <laughs> then a round of who, why, and what questions. Dennis Powell, who wrote Thus Spake Zarathustra? Nietzsche. Yes, quite right. Nietzsche. And what... Yes, and he Nietzsche was, was what? And what was he? Nietzsche well, boy. he was a rather pessimistic philosopher mm -hmm. from other Scandinavian countries. Yep, I've never read him. 
jolly good. Two marks it is. Thus spake Zarathustra, was written by um, Friedrich Nietzsche, who was a paradoxical kind of German philosopher and ethical writer in the late 19th century. He went mad in the end, but it was quite a long time after he read this thing. But there is a bit of music too, which is uh, a tone poem by Richard Strauss, which came after the book. Dennis Norden, in detective fiction, what did Lestrange and Claude Eustace Teal have in common? They had very little in common other than that they were both policemen. Yeah, um, that's fair Lestrange enough. was sometimes referred to as the wily Lestrange, <laughs> was uh, bedeviled Sherlock Holmes. Yes. And Claude Eustace Teal um, was bedeviled by Simon Templer, the saint. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's good enough. Um, what they had in common is that they were the rather long-suffering, I think, representatives of the legitimate police forces, and Sherlock Holmes and the saint, respectively, ran rings round them and caused them a frightful time. And uh, they were the opposite numbers of the private detectives. Two marks. And Scott James, how does the Atlantic Ocean get its name? Well, from a, I don't Back. know, something to do with it from Atlantis, I should think. One theory, there is another. Ah, well, let's stick to the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, the best known, the major yeah. theory. Uh, one answer right, good enough. Which is the lost continent the of Atlantis is yeah. submerged beneath it in one of those great upheavals of Mother Nature. Yes, why did, uh, uh, hmm? why was it why submerged did it beneath it? Why did it happen? Yeah. Um, well, I just said about Because they suffered from hubris. Yes, right What's right. hubris? Another question, another mark. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know. Um, well, that'll do, two marks. Uh, there are two schools of thought, as you have gathered. Uh, the more probable one is, in fact, because on the eastern side, the Atlantic Ocean is overlooked by the Atlas Mountains in Libya and northwest Africa, which look um, pretty impressive when you're sort of sailing off them. But it could refer, as Anne said, to the legendary island of Atlantis, which was so powerful and prosperous that it too at one stage was supposed to have dominated the Atlantic Ocean. And as Dennis hinted, it was because of the wickedness of its inhabitants that it sank and was then lost forever. The story comes in Plato. Two marks. Frank Muir, God tempers the wind to the shorn lamb. What's it mean? And what's wrong with it, farming-wise? It means that uh, a providence is often kind to the uh, uh, less well-equipped. Yes. La Lance Stern. Yes, quite right. Well done. That'll be a sentimental journey. Yes, yeah, sentimental journey it was. But what's wrong with it from the point of view of farming? There is something a bit so wrong. something to do with a lamb. Mm -hmm. Although it was a dead lamb. No. Because you don't shear That's live right. lambs. Yes, absolutely right. You get your two marks. Well done. Um, it means that the Lord protects the members of society who are the most vulnerable and defenceless. It comes in Stern's sentimental journey, though other people have said it before him, but mainly about sheep rather than lambs. And what's wrong, as um, Frank uh, correctly arrived at, uh, you don't shear lambs. That is, not if you're a sensible farmer, you shear sheep. Two marks. And now we come to the last round, and we go back to those quotations I gave the two teams early in the programme. For two marks, Lillis Powell, can you give me the origin of your quotation? None were for the party, all were for the state. It must be Macaulay. Mm -hmm. This is Thomas Babington Macaulay, Lays of Ancient Rome, How Horatius Kept the Bridge. None were for the party, all were for, for the state. Now, Anne Scott James, the origin of your quotation, a thing of beauty is a joy forever, its loveliness increases. It's the um, opening lines of Endymion. Uh, Keats. Mm -hmm. Two marks it is. Thing of beauty is a joy forever, its loveliness increases, it will never pass into nothingness. First lines of Keats's Endymion. And I'm going to ask Frank and Dennis to give me their explanations of how these quotations came into being. And on this occasion, the marks will go to whichever unlikely explanation receives the longer applause from the audience here in the theatre. And so, back to Frank Muir. None were for the party, all were for the state. Uh, this piece is really for the benefit of our overseas listeners. I want to tell overseas listeners for the last few weeks I've been conducting, rather unsuccessfully, a campaign towards making this country 
a classless society. Now, the trouble is that in the, um, in the past few years, until quite recently, the, uh, the main ways of detecting the class of a person you meet in the street or something <coughs> is by his clothing or the way he speaks. You, you, uh, you knew that uh, if a chap spoke rather loudly like that, with his vowels well open, <laughs> and <laughs> rather looked down his nose at you, you knew he was upper, <laughs> and um, if he tried to do the same, old lad, and um, uh, just sort of slightly missed the boat, he was middle. Uh, if he uh, sort of, uh, you know, chewed everything up a bit, like the men are speaking, <laughs> if you know what I mean, that sort of thing, he was lower. But one thing is splitting this nation still into class, and that's uh, where we all go. Because, roughly speaking, uh, the upper classes go to the lavatory. <laughs> the middle classes go to the loo. <laughs> and the lower classes go to the toilet. <laughs> now, this um, has got to be stopped. And the only way we can stop it <laughs> is to all say the same word. <clears throat> now, this is a terribly difficult thing because there isn't a word for it. You see, the thing was invented this sort of bent thing with pipes and everything, <laughs> by, um, in 1593, by Sir John Harrington. And he called it the water closet. But they were, didn't really come into use until the beginning of the Victorian times, when running water came into uh, most homes. And of course, Victorian times was a very, very bad time to start naming that place. <laughs> you couldn't even speak the word in polite company without loss of modesty. So, we got all these euphemisms starting up. Now, the difficulty lies when you have to select a euphemism to fit the person you want to ask where it is. Some people can't really bear to use any words at all. And old aunts say, um, I wonder whether you'd like to... Um, <laughs> <laughs> or they, they just say, um, Are you all right? <laughs> You get other forms, a sort of... Um, you, you also get, of course, the exact opposite, this sort of frank, virile... By the way, the bog's on the land. <laughs> <laughs> you get the... Um, you get businessman jocular. You know, uh, if you want the House of Lords, it's through the door at the end. And, and uh, excuse me, old boy, I must see whether my horse has kicked off its blanket. <laughs> You, you get the, the, the suave. Uh, do you wish comforts? <laughs> and you get the, uh, the urbane. Any of you chaps want potty? <laughs> there was um, a woman wrote to me, who was a school teacher, and said a little boy in her class said, Please, miss, Jimmy's left the room on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> We still haven't got, and we must get one. We must all decide on which one. Now, I thought the country would be with me with this. Toilet and loo are hopeless, because a toilet is actually a lady's dressing table. A lavatory is the official word for a wash basin. And the loo is a very old word from Edinburgh, when they used to chuck the stuff out of top windows of tenements and say, Gardy loo! <laughs> None of those are any good at all. We've got to have a plain, simple one or else mess about with these silly euphemisms. <laughs> so I did a bit of research around all my friends. And I had a sort of questionnaire, a sort of referendum, and said, which would you like to do? Would you like a simple English descriptive word like the pot, which is classless that we can all use, or do we all want to play around with expressions like... I must go and see whether my trusty steed has kicked off its saddle. The most extraordinary thing, and so disappointing to me, was that um, the, the response was uh, absolutely overwhelming. 
The response can be summed up in a line from uh, Macaulay's lovely poem, The, the Labs of Ancient Rome. Um, <laughs> when, I'd, when I'd counted all the replies for my referendum, uh, none were for the potty, all were for the steed. <laughs> Well, now on to Dennis Norton. If you remember, his quotation was, a thing of beauty is a joy forever, its loveliness increases. Abbott and Costello used to do a routine where the fat one said, when I marry, I want to marry an ugly girl. The other one said, why? He said, because if you marry a beautiful girl, if she runs away, you're broken hearted. You see, marry an ugly girl, if she runs away, who cares? <laughs> now, a rather distorted version of this situation happened to uh, a close friend of mine um, who, because I don't want anybody to be able to identify him, I would call Fred. Because every Tom, Dick and Harry is called Fred. So. <laughs> now, he married one of the most stunning looking girls that I've ever met. She was gorgeous. She was so sexy that I used to have to take my glasses off to talk politely to her. <laughs> <laughs> one trouble of it was, and this is the whole point, something he didn't know, that as a housewife, she turned out to be the biggest slob that ever slopped around the house. Now, I met Fred just a week or so ago, and he was one of the most dejected looking individuals you, you could ever see. He said, she's hopeless. Have you ever met anybody who makes tea in the steam iron? <laughs> I said, well, well at, at, at least she, she does ironing. He said, look at this shirt. <laughs> he said, I realize it's possible when a woman's doing the washing to rip buttons off. He said, but button holes. <laughs> he said, he said, do you know when I, when I persuaded her to do the spring cleaning? August. <laughs> it is absolutely ludicrous seeing a girl walking around in a sundress picking up off the floor the tinsel from the Christmas tree. <laughs> <clears throat> I said, well, well, you know, it can't be all bad. He said, you must, I mean, after all, she cooks. He said, cooks. He said, you've heard about the, these karate experts who can cut a plank in two with one chop. He said, who do you think cooks that chop. <laughs> he said, he said, as a matter of fact, he said, in a way, he said, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that she cooks so badly. He said, because she can't even be bothered to light a fire. He says, that the only warmth I get in the winter months is heartburn. <laughs> see, so, you know, I tried to console with him. I said, look, look, it, it's because she's a beautiful girl, that's all. She's just not, not used to this sort of thing. But, but she'll learn, you know. How long have you been married now? He said, 17 years. <laughs> he said, it, it gets worse. He said, can you imagine what happens to a place when you've been sweeping the dirt under the carpet for 17 years? <laughs> He says, our drawing room, when you go in, you walk uphill. <laughs> now, what I... I do think it's, it's a tragic case, but it's also quite a warning to anybody listening who may be contemplating marrying a beautiful girl. Because it's very obvious. What you've got to do first is find out if she's a secret slob. Because if she is it gets worse. Or in the words of Keats, who I think really summed it up, a thing of beauty is a joy forever, 
but slovenliness increases. <laughs> And by your vote, um, Frank Muir wins the contest of the two stories, and over the contest as a whole, uh, he and Dillis Powell win by three and a half marks. And that brings to an end this edition of My Word. In My Word, you heard Dillis Powell, Anne Scott James, Frank Muir, and Dennis Norton, introduced by Jack Longland. The programme was devised by Tony Shryan and Edward J. Mason and presented by the BBC. BBC presents My Word. And here to introduce the programme and the panel is Jack Longland. My Word is a word game played by people whose business is words, and those taking part are Anne Scott James, Dennis Norton, Tillis Powell, and Frank Muir. Round one tries to test uh, respective vocabularies. <coughs> Two marks, they get the meaning of these words right. We begin with Anne Scott James. Anne, what is a dry bob? Or if you prefer it in two words, you can have it. Dry bob. It takes one back to, not my school days, but somebody's school days. Um, that sort of rather um, quiet, remote, rather little-known school in the provinces called Eton. Yeah. The um, boys in the summer are divided into dry bobs and wet bobs. Why? And the dry bobs play cricket, mm -hmm. which is fairly awful, but the wet bobs, poor suckers, row. They're <laughs> 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 oh, absolutely dead right, and it's two marks, and it comes from that curious school near Slough, um, Eton, and dry bobs, chapel plays cricket. Frank Muir, what is or are virginals, V-I-R... <laughs> uh, like virginal with an S on the end. Phrasing it very carefully, <laughs> I'd say they are pianos that have never been played. <laughs> <laughs> They actually, I think, uh, precede pianos, don't they? Yes. And before pianos, there were spinets yes. and virginals and square pianos. And I think square pianos were spinets and or virginals on legs. Mm -hmm. And one of them, or both of them, uh, I think virginals were, didn't have legs. They're quite small, oblong things that mm -hmm. you put on something, such as the piano. <laughs> <laughs> to play. Well, well done, Frank. That was a very erudite answer. Uh, two marks. <laughs> Dillis Power, what is the meaning of Dolly Coppedus? It's something footed. Yeah. Um, it's a very long word. Long footed. Absolutely right. <laughs> <laughs> Dolly Coppedus means having long feet, like uh, one of Villon's girls, Bertha Bigfoot, in that lovely ballad of the dead ladies. Um, Dennis Norton, what is Vivi Sepulcher? Sepulcher is a tomb, mm -hmm. and Vivi, it's a Vivi, uh, a vivacious, it's a tomb with, um, 
with neon lighting. <laughs> <laughs> Some kind of lively tomb. That's all I can get. I think what's lively word. is inside rather than outside. buried alive. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> Great, uh, well yeah. done, yes. But we go out and purr, Rob makes one thing come. That's it, yes. In Fall of the House of Usher and all that sort of thing, yes. Vivious departure means burying alive, which is a fairly nasty sort of thought. When you were very young, you used you to think and worry about this a lot? Um, I did. <laughs> yes. It was yes, my I kink, did. you know, when I was eight. I had a different kink when... No, I didn't... <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 I'm, I'm sorry. That was when I was nine. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, before we begin round two, I give each team a quotation form to write down, and with luck, the two women members of the teams will go on studying those quotations because I shall ask them where the quotations come from at the end. Hans Scott James and Dennis Norton, your quotation is Marry in haste, repent at leisure. And Dillis Bowden and Frank, yours is Where my caravan has rested. And then at the end of the programme, I shall ask Dennis and Frank to give me their idea of how these came to be said or written. Round two is a round of odds and ends. Two marks for correct answers. And Scott James, a play with a controversial theme entitled The Children's Hour, written by a well-known woman writer, was made into a film under another name. Can I have the name of the film and the name of the writer? The writer was Lillian Hellman. Yep. But that was the writer of the play, whether she wrote the film, I don't know. Children's I don't are... think. I'm going to remember. I don't um, remember what they're... And when it became a film, it was called The Loudest Whisper. The original play, and I suppose the script, I don't know, of the film, was written by Lillian Hellman, and the theme was homosexuality. Frank Muir, what is a witch's Sabbath? A witch's Sabbath? It's a, a sort of um, mothering-in-law Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> it's what the Germans call Walpurgisnacht. Yeah. It's the night that all the witch and, witches and their covens come out and... Um, they meet a particular chap. Is it Beelzebub? Yes, I'll do. All right, two marks it is. Witches' Sabbath is a midnight meeting of demons and witches and sorcerers, and it's presided over by the devil. And it was supposed to be held annually as a special kind of orgy. Um, there have been some indications that things like this are still going on, but I'm not certain whether they guarantee that the devil will personally attend these days. Too much. <coughs> Dillis Power, why did Mr Pickwick come to find himself in the Fleet Prison? Because... Um, Mrs. Bartle? Bartle. Mm, there is Mrs. Bartle. Um, mistook or was persuaded to mistake his intentions when she fell into his arms. Mm -hmm. And she then brought a breach of promise against him, mm -hmm. and he said, The hell with you. Yes. Mm -hmm. Good enough. Yes. <laughs> Two marks of well tears. <laughs> Gal. Mr. Pickwick refused to pay damages awarded against him by the courts in the case of Bardell versus Pickwick. Now, Dennis Norton. In Roman times, what law was known as the Storks Law? S-T-O-R-K-S. The Storks Law. It was a law against overpopulation <laughs> <laughs> in which everybody was obliged to stand on one leg. <laughs> like a stork, you see. And thus, more space was created between people. <laughs> Would you know that there used to be in British, in British film censorship, there used to be a law, which I think Dillis will vouch for, that if a couple were shown in bed together, the man had to keep one foot on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> right. And this led Fred Allen, um, a great American humorist, when he read about this, to remark that sex in England appears to have the same rules as snooker. <laughs> Oh, storks were lucky and you weren't allowed to shoot them. How about that? I don't know. Don't I think, think one out of two for in ingenuity and effrontery. Um, <laughs> stork's law was a law that obliged children to maintain their aged and needy parents when they became um, old. And it was supposed to be an imitation of the stork because the stork young are supposed to look after the 
old birds. I haven't been able to check this with any ornithologist, and I expect a most frightful post back as the result. <laughs> anyway, that was the stork's law. By a stork. <laughs> well, in the next round, I give each member of each team a quotation and ask them to try and add the next line or two. Two marks if they can finish off the quotation, and two marks for saying author and poem. Anne Scott James. No longer mourn for me when I am dead than you shall hear the surly, sullen bell give warning to the world that I am fled from this vile world with vilest worms to dwell. But well, it's a Shakespearean sonnet and I can't yes. finish it. Can you finish it? Uh, there's another line about when I'm compounded with clay mm -hmm. or when I with clay am compounded, you know, one of those. Yeah, that's later on. Yeah, just doesn't follow immediately. I don't know how it goes on at all. Clay, it's not Jan Cassius has a lean and hungry. <laughs> <laughs> Two and a half. Uh, you knew some lines that come later on. It is um, Shakespeare, sonnet number 71. Um, no longer mourn for me when I am dead, then you shall hear the surly, sullen bell give warning to the world that I am fled from this vile world with vilest worms to dwell. Nay, if you read this line, remember not the hand that writ it, for I love you so that I in your sweet thoughts would be forgot if thinking on me then should make you woe. And it goes on with the line a bit later that Dennis Grady. Two and a half. Frank Muir, rather different. He has many friends, laymen and clerical. Old Foss is the name of his cat. His body is perfectly spherical. And he wears a bifurcated titfer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes. He wears a runcible hat. Yes, quite right. It's Lear. Mm -hmm. Edward Lear. Four marks it is. <clears throat> now, dear Lispow, there has fallen a splendid tear from the passion flower at the gate. She is coming, my dove, my dear. She is coming, my life, my fate. The red rose cries, she is near, she is near, and the white rose weeps, she is late. Well, it's Tennyson. Mm hmm. It's come into the garden, Maud. Yes. He gets a bit overexcited. Yes, he does. <laughs> right, <isn't> he? <laughs> and tenors shriek a bit. Yes. What, is the, what was the last bit? White She's... rose weeps, she is late. I don't know. This is Come Into the Garden Moored by Lord Tennyson. The red rose cries, she is near, she is near, and the white rose weeps, she is late. The larkspur listens, I hear, I hear, and the lily whispers, I wait. Now, Dennis Norton. There are men in the village of Eurith whom nobody seeth or heareth, and there looms on the marge of the river a barge. Where they're puting a... Television theory. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you want to point your barge it. in a particular direction, what do we have to do? You steer, steer it. it. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> right Get up the sharp end and steer it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Um, I don't know what to mark you. Uh, oh, two, a lot. Two high, and a half. High. Two and a half, I, I think. Down, just, uh, <laughs> give me goods instead. <laughs> <laughs> this is a... Anonymous, and well might be, I think it's early 19th century, and it runs, there are men in the village of Erith whom nobody seeth or heareth, and there looms on the marge of the river a barge that nobody roweth or stirreth. Well, now we come to the last round, and we go back to those two quotations I gave the teams earlier in the programme. Two marks, and Scott James. Can you give me the origin of the quotation, marry in haste, repent at leisure? Well, I think it's a proverb. Mm -hmm. Do you know anybody who quoted it? Every father and mother has said it to their mm. son and daughter about to get wed. Mm. I think that's good enough. I think you'll get your marks. It started as a Greek proverb, I think. Uh, it's quoted in 1566 by a chap called William Painter in a book, Palace of Pleasures. Comes in Congreve's The Old Bachelor, and that uh, ubiquitous American Benjamin Franklin used it too. Now, Dillis Bow, can I have the origin of your quotation? Where my caravan has rested. Well, it's a very sentimental song. Mm -hmm. Where my Good. caravan has rested. Do you know? That's right. Da da yes. da 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 da. Is it? Da 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 da
<laughs> it's a 19th century song where my caravan has rested flowers I leave you on the grass and it's by a chap called Edward Teschemacher which is a rather difficult name assumed name huh? <laughs> <laughs> and now I'm going to ask Dennis and Frank to give me their explanation of how these quotations came into being and on this occasion the marks will go to whichever incredible explanation gets the longer applause from the audience here in the theatre and so we go back to Dennis Norton and his quotation, Marry in haste, repent at leisure. When I joined the RAF, I, I couldn't help but sort of shrug modestly when they said to me, ever done any flying? <laughs> Little did they know, they were talking to a chap who'd played one of the lead parts in Peter Pan. <laughs> <laughs> and when I say one of the lead parts, I mean a star part, Wendy. <laughs> of course, I was, um, I was only 11 at the time. I don't mean the time I joined the RF, I mean the time I played in Peter Pan. I was, it was a council school, and my class, Mrs Henley's class, had been called upon to do the play for the school prize-giving day. Now, we didn't actually pick Peter Pan. Uh, what we picked was Desire Under the Elm. <laughs> um, in fact, we'd been rehearsing Desire Under the Elm <laughs> with some enthusiasm for about 11 weeks before the headmaster happened to drop in to see how we were getting on in the middle of the seduction scene. <laughs> And he rather sort of blew his top and um, said, I'm not having this. He said, uh, you'll do something much more suitable. You'll do Sir James Barry's play, Peter Pan. Now, there were only 10 days to go before prize giving day and it would tax the resources of the old Vic <laughs> to put on a production of Peter Pan in 10 days. But nevertheless, we did it and we licked the whole thing except for the one rather essential ingredient of Peter Pan, which was the flying bit. Fortunately, we had a chap called Johnny Winkler, who was a bit of a, a whiz at scientific things, and he fixed up this device, which went up over the rafters, down, across a pulley, down to me. <laughs> I was in a kind of harness. And he didn't get it perfected until the day before we were due to go on. It was a great moment when they strapped me in this kind of thing, and he went to this wheel that he had, you know, and everybody's sort of murmuring, you can't send a kid up in a crate like that, you know. <laughs> and he wound, and strangely enough, it worked. Up, 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 I went soaring. It was the most marvellous sensation. I could look down, I saw all my mates about 30 feet below, everybody was cheering, everybody thought it was wonderful, and we knew, you know, it was a blend of sensations. This was going to thrill the audience, and it thrilled me, and it was marvellous, and uh, Johnny was receiving congratulations from everybody. And he said, fine, all right, let's get on the rehearsal and pull him down. So he turned the wheel the other way, and nothing happened. <laughs> well, he kept on trying for about an hour. <laughs> And still nothing. Now, I must point out, this was a rather high school hall. I was about a feet, foot below the rafters, you see. Finally, we had to send for the headmaster, who was livid. <laughs> but really sort of vivid livid, you know, because... <laughs> he said, <clears throat> get him down at once. Sir, we can't, sir. Sir, we don't know how to, sir. Sir. So somebody said, shall we send for the fire brigade, sir? And he said, no, don't. Go and get the long ladder from the caretakers. And please, sir, sir, the caretaker's gone home, sir. Sir, he won't be back till tomorrow, sir. He said, very well, he'll have to stay there all night. <laughs> so I had to send for my mother, you know, came and saw her boy, one foot below the rafters, 30 feet in the air, you know. And she carried on a bit. She said, what's he going to do about his supper? Um, <laughs> Because my mother's one of those people who, who think of all emergencies in terms of food. You know. And she said, I've made him chicken soup and fried meatballs. <laughs> well, they solved that. 
the um, chicken soup was put in a bucket <laughs> and by using the school hose, <laughs> which we had for firefighting drill, um, I managed to acquire the soup. Now, the, the fried meatballs, we had this netball team. <laughs> And they sent for this girl who was called the Shooter. You know? <laughs> and she was pretty good. She, I got most of them in the, in the mouth. Um, but there I was all night until the caretaker arrived the next morning. I, I think I soloed for about 14 hours <laughs> altogether. Of course, when the, the head, as far as the headmaster was concerned, he cancelled all flying for that day. Uh, no Peter Pan. And of course, it was his fault purely because of the haste in which we had undertaken this production and it was possibly the best example of a very old theatrical warning which says bury in haste repent at leisure That's the only production of Peter Pan over the elms that I've ever heard of. <laughs> and now we go on to Frank Muir's quotation. If you remember, that was, Where my caravan has rested. Where my caravan has rested. Yesterday evening, about um, quarter to nine, I was taken with a, a desperate and urgent need for a walnut and a pair of braces. <laughs> But looking through the window, I could see that the ginger cat from next door was in amongst our cabbages. <laughs> now, <laughs> I found the walnut quite easily, left over from Christmas. But where to find a pair of braces quickly? Because they've rather gone out of fashion. Thought I immediately, mind racing, the cupboard under the stairs. Everything is in the cupboard under the stairs. Rushed in. Suddenly I was overcome by... A a feeling, it's rather difficult to describe. It's not unlike bashing your top, the top of your head against a gas meter. <laughs> when I recovered consciousness, <laughs> I'd forgotten the reason I'd gone into the cupboard under the stairs. But I decided to look around while I was there for two reasons. One, because old junk is always interesting. And two, because I closed the door behind me. <laughs> And cupboards under the stairs always only have a lock on the outside. So I looked around, there was the usual stuff, and underneath was a box. And I suddenly realised that in that box were all the old inventions I'd invented. They were the ways, years ago, when I was going to get rich, when I was going to make my pile. And inside the box there was a, a padded cloth ashtray with a sort of six-inch circle of dress elastic at the top, one side, and a little lead weight at the other. I thought, now, what was that? What was it? Then I remembered. The elastic went round your head. Do you remember when you're young and running for a bus? The bus stop is about half a mile down the road, and the bus is coming from the other direction. <laughs> and as you run, you keep looking over your shoulder to see how far you... Well, eventually you bash into a lamppost. <laughs> and this is an ear guard. <laughs> it's, it's held by elastic round the side. The little lead weight keeps it hanging over the air. And as you dash along, seeing whether the taxi's coming or the bus is coming, and when you hit something or somebody, it protects the ear. It's rather clever because you could unhook it with a popper and fasten it to the other side of the elastic for use on the continent. <laughs> <coughs> then I picked up another thing, which was an old rusty electric fan, and the, uh, all the rust was dropping off and forming a pile on the ground. It was so old and oxidised. And just in front of the fan were three night lights. And then these tubes leading away. I suddenly realised, I suddenly remembered what my invention was. You know why, what it's for, of course. I mean, you've only got to think. <laughs> Dinner parties. Curry. Now, you know, when you have a very hot curry, the back of your neck goes very cold <laughs> and wet. 
Well, when that happened, I was going to start up my electric motor. The air would go over the night lights, and warm air would play along these rubber tubes, which I'd hand to the guests. <laughs> and the warm air could then be played over this cold sweat on the back of the neck. You see. It was a marvellous, it was the answer to hot curry dinners. And there it was, rusting away in this box, and I thought, well, that's my hope. So I'd hoped to make a pile of money, and that's what I've ended up with. And I thought, what a marvellous ballad that would make. You know, and looking at the little pile still trickling onto the carpet, I thought to myself, I know the first line. Where my curry fan has rusted. <laughs> <laughs> By your vote, um, Frank Muir wins the contest of the two stories, and uh, the entire contest of my word, he and Dillis Powell win by two marks, and that brings to an end this edition of My Word. <laughs> In My Word, you heard Dillis Powell, Anne Scott James, Frank Muir and Dennis Norton, introduced by Jack Longland. The programme was devised by Tony Shryan and Edward J. Mason and presented by the BBC. BBC presents My Word. And here to introduce the programme and the panel is Jack Longland. My Word is a word game played by people whose business is words, and those taking part are Dillis Powell, Frank Muir, Anne Scott James, and Dennis Norton. Here's round one to test their respective vocabularies. Two marks if they get the meaning of these words right. Dillis Powell, to begin with. Dillis, what is an idolum? I-D-O-L-U-M. Idolum. Idolum. A Greek word. Mm-hmm. It should have an O-N, not an U-M on the end. Yes, I quite agree, but it was mm. used by... That's pedantic, but anyhow. Yeah. Uh, it means a kind of idol. But what kind of idol? An, an image. Necessarily material. Oh, necessary. I beg your pardon? Is it necessarily material? Um, no, 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 no. It could no, be no. stone. <laughs> it's philosophic. It could be plastic. It means a phantom or a spirit or a mental image or an idea, and in logic, it means a fallacy. Two marks. Dennis Norton, what is gallophobia? G A W L O and phobia. Gallophobia. It's an unreasonable hatred of anything Gallic or French. Absolutely right, Dennis. Well done. <laughs> hatred or even a morbid dread of the French. Two marks. Anne Scott James. What is formaldehyde? Oh, oh it's what you uh, pickle people's amputated limbs in. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you might. And, and therefore, what There's is no it? No harm in that. Well, it's a <laughs> It's uh, a preservative. What, yes. What, what, won't that do, sort of thing? I think that's do. Yeah. Two marks. Uh, formaldehyde is a disinfectant, a preservative, and it can be an antiseptive. And uh, formalin is the watery or aqueous solution of this. Same sort of root as the acid that you find in ants, formic acid. Now, Frank, now, 
What is a lay? L E I, a lay. <laughs> well, despite what it sounds like, <laughs> it's a rather sort of tatty garland of uh, crepe paper <laughs> which is hung round the necks of unsuspecting tourists to the Caribbean. <laughs> Uh, Caribbean? Uh, Caribbean? Yeah. No, I wouldn't have thought so. Well, no, no, the Pacific South Isles, South the, the, the South Pacific Isles. Go through the Panama Canal, yes. It should, it should be fresh flowers, but uh, mm. a bit too expensive. Mm. Yes, I think it'll do. Uh, it's a garland of flowers, and as um, Frank says, you, you greet the tourist or the visitor um, by hanging this round his or her neck, usually a beautiful dusky maiden in Hawaii does it. And I think it should be, not paper, but hibiscus. I think that's right. Tropical flower of some sort, anyway. They say aloha. Yes, that's right. <laughs> Meaning come back. <laughs> yes, or it does. Will you know come back? <laughs> two marks. Well, before we begin round two, I give each team a quotation for them to write down. And I want the two women members of the teams to go on studying these quotations, because at the end I shall ask them where those quotations come from. And Dillis Powell and Frank Muir, your quotation is... Oh, for the wings, for the wings of a dove. And Anne, Scott, James and Dennis, yours is humble cares and delicate fears. And then at the end of the programme, I shall ask Frank and Dennis to give me their idea of how these came to be written or said. This next round, I give each member of each team a quotation and ask them to complete it for the next line or two. Two marks if they can complete the quotation and two more for correctly naming its source. Phyllis Powell, did ye not hear it? No, twas but the wind, or the car rattling, or the stony street. On with the dance. Byron. Yes. It's Byron, it's about the Battle of Waterloo. Yes. That's before it, actually. Um, try and complete it, I think you could do it. On with the dance. The joy be unconfined. Yeah. Is that enough? Uh, that's jolly good. Oh, I can't do much more. Let's <laughs> try be unconfined. Yes, uh, three and a half, I think. Uh, Lord Byron's poem on the eve of Waterloo, which is a, a canto in Child Harold. Um, no, it was but the wind or the car rattling all the stony street. On with the dance, let joy be unconfined. No sleep till morn, when youth and pleasure meet to chase the glowing hours with flying feet. Lord Byron. Dennis Norton. Fair youth, beneath the trees, thou canst not leave thy song, nor ever can those trees be bare. Bold lover, never, never canst thou kiss, though winning near the girl, yet do not grieve. It's the old and the Grecian urn. Yes. Um, which starts, thou still unravished bride of quietness. Yes. I can't remember it, but, you know. And author, sorry, you didn't mention John it. Keats. Yep. Um, three and a half again, I think. John Keats is owed on a Grecian urn. Bold lover, never, never canst thou kiss, though winning near the girl, yet do not grieve. She cannot fade, though thou hast not thy bliss. Forever wilt thou love, and she be fair. Now in Scott James. Some love too little, some too long. Some sell, and others buy. Some do the deed with many tears and some without a sign. Mm. This is, um, each, each man must kill the thing he loves. That's it. Isn't it? It's the Ballad of Reading Jail, isn't it? Is it? Is it? Is it? Is it? Is it? Yes. Oscar Wilde, yes. yeah. yeah. A clever old Jew. <laughs> <laughs> it's the, we think it's the Ballad of Reading Jail by, by Oscar Wilde. Yes, and you're dead right. And um, Dennis did get, in fact, the next line, so I think that's four. For each man kills the thing he loves, yet each man does not die. Now, Frank, no. And not by eastern windows only, when daylight comes, comes in the light, in front the sun climbs slow, how slowly? Because the sun has been out all night. <laughs> West could look the land is bright. What? West could look the land is bright, I assure you. Yes. What does that mean? Mm. But Do you know it? Yes, dear, but West would look the land. <laughs> but west would look, the land is apparently is bright. That's absolutely right. Yes, yes. It's a poem, Jack. Yes, bye. Uh, hang on a minute, what? <laughs> <laughs> by, by, by Clough. Yes, you're absolutely right. You get your four marks. Between you, you get your four marks. And not by eastern windows only, when daylight comes, comes in the light. In front, the sun climbs slow, how slowly, 
but westward, look, the land is bright. Arthur Hugh Clough, say not the struggle, nor availeth. Well, now, a round of origins and derivations, and what we get here is three marks if members of the teams can, first of all, define the present meaning and then give me the origin and derivation of these words or expressions or phrases. Uh, Dillis Powell, flush, used in the sense you're very flush today. Uh, what do I have to do with this? Sir? I want to know the present meaning. <laughs> 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 what it comes from. Uh, <laughs> Leave it as you would wish to find it. <laughs> comes from the French. Roses have it. The... Do they? You have a flush He's of very... roses. I do. He's anyway. very flush. Very flush. Oh, very sort of full of money. Very yes. rich, very well off. That's right. Doing well. And how does it come to mean that? Well, a flush means oh. a congestion of blood to the bl <laughs> surface blood vessels. Yes. Uh, which g g roses. I've got a rose hedge, which you say it has a flush. A flush, When it, it, um, when it has a, a, profound, you know, a multiplicity of blooms suddenly. I, I think I'll get to, you get your marks. It means uh, you seem to be very rich today. All of a sudden, this is the point I was trying to get out of you, uh, you're very flush, and it's a sudden access of riches. And it's like the rush of blood to the face, which is called a flush, as Frank quite rightly said, or flush with something that is level with the top of it. And if your pocket was absolutely flush with money, it would mean that you couldn't put any more sovereigns inside. You can take your choice. Three mark. Dennis Norton, to Shanghai someone. Well, that means to induce somebody, generally by um, rather violent means, to go somewhere they never intended to go. Yes. And it used to be done by press gangs and people who would slip dope into sailors' drinks and put them on board ships for long journeys. They don't... They very rarely do it. Now, the only occasion it's used sometimes is for with audiences for certain BBC comedy shows. <laughs> <laughs> but it's practically fallen out of... Uh... And the point about Shanghai is... Well, I presume it's a long way away. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, absolutely right. Three marks it is. Anne Scott James, you may have heard a French artiste, Jean Sablon, singing a song about a fiacre. What is a fiacre and how does it get its name? Well, it is a horse cab. Mm -hmm. And I should think it comes... Because if you were, could afford in those sad, poor old days to hire a cab, it meant you were very proud or fier. Oh, dear. I'll give you a bit of a bonus, Mark. You tell me how many wheels it's got. You can only have two, three or... Two, three or four. <laughs> <laughs> two hind legs and one little front one. <laughs> two out of three, I think. <laughs> Fairly generous. Um, Fiacre is a French four-wheeled cab or hackney coach, and the reason it was called so was that the first place stand or station where these coaches were was in 1650 at the Hotel de Saint-Fiacre in Paris. And if you ask me who Saint-Fiacre was, I really can't tell you. He was the son of an Irish king, born in 600, who settled in France and built a sanctuary and monastery at Bray. And his saint's day is observed on August the 30th, and that's the day when all the cab drivers go on strike. <laughs> Two out of three. And now, Frank Muir, in a paddy. Gale. It means planting rice. <laughs> 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 or alternatively, it means um, within an Irishman. <laughs> <laughs> alternatively, it means um, in a bad temper. Yes. Why? Having a spat, unless it's anything to do with Irishmen. It is, yeah. Mm. Quick tempered Irishmen. Uh, that's what we think it is. Mm. Uh, two and a half. <laughs> uh, Frank was quite right in saying it means a sudden loss of temper, rather a small scale rage, I think, because uh, it's often used with children who have sort of mini rages. And it does come just from the Irish paddy. And the idea is, and this is probably a terrible libel, that any Irishman is willing at any time to enter into either an argument, a heated one, or a fight. And that was why in a paddy or in a paddy whack. And I'm told that paddy whack means a very large and tough Irishman. Two and a half. 
Well, now we come to the last round and go back to those two quotations I gave the teams earlier in the program. For two marks, Dillis Powell, can you give me the origin of your quotation? O oh, for the wings, for the wings of a dove. It's a song. No, it's a, it's a ballad. It's a ballad, it's a song. Uh, let's have um, a compo author. composer, can we? Composer? Mm. Mendelssohn. Yes. <laughs> and I'm told that the words uh, are by W. Bartholomew. Now, Anne Scott James, let's have the origin of your quotation. Humble cares and delicate fears. Well, I think it was one of those poets who was always cracking up the virtues of poverty mm -hmm. and the simple life. He preferred simple life in Cumberland. Oh, well. Uh, that rather limits the field. Um, I should think it's words for... Yes. <laughs> you don't know the name of the poem? Um, frankly, no. <laughs> One out of two, I think. Um, it's Wordsworth's poem, The Sparrow's Nest. She gave me eyes, she gave me ears, and humble cares and delicate fears. And now I'm going to ask Frank and Dennis to give me their explanation of how these quotations came into being. And on this occasion, the marks will go to whichever incredible explanation gets the longer applause from the audience here in the theatre. So that back to Frank Muir and his quotation, <coughs> Oh, for the wings, for the wings of a dove. Uh, Your Royal Highness, uh, Your Excellency, my Lord Bishop, uh, my Lords. Well, you never know who might be listening to this programme. <laughs> Politeness doesn't cost anything, does it? <laughs> There is an argument you can hear on all sides that Britain is becoming a second-class nation. Our ships have now been cut down to a half and the 50% that's left needs a new propeller. <laughs> that our moral values are changing. <laughs> if these allegations are true, I know why Britain has declined. It has declined as a great power due, in my view, to the decline of the boiled pudding. <laughs> the good old-fashioned steamed suet pudding has fallen into desuetude. <laughs> it is a fact. Ladies and gentlemen, I put it to you. When the workman goes into his canteen, what sort of pud is he served up with? Baked Manchester tart. When he gets it, what is it? It's a thickish cardboard, lightly smeared with raspberry-flavoured red lead. <laughs> is that food for a working man? Is that... Will that give him energy? The Prime Minister, when he flies to Moscow, he gets an airline meal. What is the pud you get in an airline? Half a tinned apricot. <laughs> Cold at that, resting on some soggy rice. How can he face leaders of other country with that under his belt. <laughs> no, we should go back to serving what built up this country to its greatness, suet pud. Think back to those early days when we had suet pud at school, when we had suet pud at home. The many varieties that the memory conjures up. Boiled baby. Do you remember? <laughs> Boiled baby is the long one with a bit of cloth wrapped round. <laughs> When the cloth is unwound, you can see the indentations of the creases. You have to sort of scrape the slime off before you, <laughs> before you cut it. But it had substance. <laughs> Figgy duff. Some years ago, about two years ago, I organised a figgy duff party for the deprived men who lived in my locality, whose wives were, were brought up to serve them pink froth and stuff for pud. And we had a figgy duff made. It took two men to lift it onto the table. <laughs> we went into training, of course. We all went to a health farm beforehand and, and colonic irrigation and so forth. And for, for four days beforehand, we just had a slice of Melba toast each and some warm distilled water. And then just before the meal, we had half a lightly boiled egg each and then a six-inch slice of this figgy duff. It was magnificent. I suppose, best of all, was that feeling of repletion, that, that pain of fullness, which came when you'd had that deliciously little bit too much of a boiled duff. It was a, the, 
the stomach was sort of split. It was tight as a drum. Normally flabby. After this, you could crack a flea on it. <clears throat> and the pain, you had a slight charming pain. Halfway between an attack of the wind and the old-fashioned twinges. The name for it was the whinge. You always had the whinge about quarter past three after having a, a duff for lunch. And that's why I say that nowadays all this has been lost to us and we should get back to it because I'm nostalgic for it. I mean, after having a, a spoonful of this pink mess you get nowadays as a sweet, even if there's a marvellous taste sensation, the acme of the pastry cook's art, I often think to myself, quite nice, but oh, for the whinge, for the whinge of a duff. <laughs> wanted to know what the suet crisis was about and now I'm doing it. And we go back to Dennis Norton and if you remember his quotation was humble cares and delicate fears. There is a distinguished and world famous store which is as they say not a hundred miles from this studio which is possibly the poshest and most daunting establishment in London. And what I keep telling myself about it, this place is, it's just a grocer's shop. <laughs> Never mind all that, it's just a grocer's. Why I keep telling myself that is I have just received a bill from them. <laughs> to groceries, £137.10. <laughs> now you may say, how did you run up a bill for groceries from this place for £137.10? And the answer is, I didn't run it up. I ran it down. Now, if you ask, how did you run it down? I will say, stop asking questions. And I'll tell you, you see, it is my custom, and has been for some time, to go into this establishment every week before this broadcast. I go in there not to purchase any caviar or pâté de foie gras, or those lark's tongues in aspic. I go in there to use their gents. <laughs> now, they have a gents in there, which it's like a cathedral. <laughs> and I went in there last week to wash my hands and do my hair, which is what I do, as I say, every week. And I went in there, I strolled in, I washed my hands, and then... I got some water and I put it on my hair and they have these marvellous bottles of stuff there which I could never afford under the normal circumstances. You know, the, the wonderful, ineffable sort of fragrance. And I took a bottle of this and I sprinkled it on my hair and I mussed it all up. And I put my hand in my pocket for a comb to comb it there and found I didn't have one. <laughs> and usually they have this... I couldn't call him a man, he's a gentleman in there, in a, in a uniform, and he sort of lightly passes a brush across the back of your collar for half a crown. <laughs> and he wasn't there last. I think he was holidaying in the Bahamas. Or something. <laughs> so there I was, and I couldn't stroll out among all these dukes and lords who were in there buying their baked beans, you know, looking like this. <laughs> I thought, well, the sensible thing to do is I'll just wait in there until somebody else comes in, and whoever comes in, I'll, I'll ask if I may borrow a comb from him, you see. So I hung about in there, you see. It's a very strange sensation, it's all by yourself in this other echoing place. After a few minutes, a chap came in and just about to approach him, and he sort of went past me at speed, and... Um, <laughs> <clears throat> now, this chap had on his military-looking chap, actually, and he'd shot me a rather keen glance <laughs> when he'd come in, and he'd sort of sniffed a bit at this <laughs> fragrance, which really was, it was rather like Claudia Cardinale's flanks. I was a, you know, you know what I mean? And it's very strange, looking at the back of him, 
I saw the rear of his neck change expression. <laughs> and this is possible. You know, and then he swung round and I said, excuse me, he said, don't talk to me. I said, I don't know why you're taking this attitude, but all I want is a loan of your comb. Now, it was only as the words left my lips that I noticed that he was completely bald. <laughs> Now, that is how I acquired this rather massive grocer's bill. I came out of that door at such a lick, I knocked down the supply, a display of bottled pears in Kirsch. They smashed down to the floor. Fifty-four of them actually smashed. That's what I mean when I said I ran down a grocer's bill. Of course, I still think the bill is a bit steep, actually, even though it's 54 bottles. But the man explained, it isn't the pears that are expensive, it's the spirit in which they are bottled. So that explains how you can, under given circumstances, run up a grocer's bill of £137.10 by means of, as Wordsworth put it, humble pears and delicate kirsch. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, by your vote, Dennis Norden just wins the contest of the two stories, but nevertheless, the entire contest is won by Frank Muir and Dillis Powell by exactly half a mark, and that brings to an end this edition of My Word. In My Word, you heard Dillis Powell, Anne Scott James, Frank Muir and Dennis Norden, introduced by Jack Longland. The programme was devised by Tony Shryan and Edward J. Mason and presented by the BBC. BBC presents My Word. And here to introduce the programme and the panel is Jack Longland. My Word is a word game played by people whose business is words, and those taking part are Anne Scott James, Dennis Norton, Dillis Powell, and Frank Muir. Here's round one to test their respective vocabularies. Two marks if they get the meaning of these words right. Begin with Anne, Anne Scott James. Anne, what is a pseudologer? P-S-E-U-D-O-L-O-G-E-R, pseudologer. Well, pseudo means false. Mm -hmm. I should think it means a member of parliament. <laughs> <laughs> it means somebody who, always, who never tells the truth. Yes, I think so. I disregard your previous gloss and give you two marks. It means a systematic liar. <laughs> <laughs> All right, quickly on to Frank Muir. Frank. Why? I'm not a systematic liar. <laughs> 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 we'll see. Uh, Frank, what is or are oughts? O R T S. Oughts. 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 Mm -hmm. It's. They are. They're. They're promptings of the conscience. 
<laughs> I ought to go and see <laughs> to go and see my mother this weekend. <laughs> well, for a girl, I ought to say good night here, but do come up for a cup of coffee. <laughs> Promptings of conscience. No, spelling a bit wrong this time. Bits left over. Yes. Bits on. left over. My charming and incredibly talented partner thinks it's bits left over. Oughts. We call that shepherd's a... pie. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ever do. It's a pretty archaic word anyway, but their refuse or leavings or scraps, particularly of food, comes in Shakespeare, let him have time a beggar's oughts to crave. You've got your two marks. Tell us, Powell, what is the meaning of raptorial? R-A-P-T-O-R-I-A-L, raptorial. Something to be snatched away in a dream. Something to do with snatching, sir. Snatching. An abduction, abducting. <laughs> no? Seized. Seized? Mm. That doesn't help. Seized, as you might say, up. Oh. Or... Um, ha <laughs> ha having, a, having a kind of um, um, wrapped fit. No, I'm not no? going to get it. I'm sorry. It means predatory. Uh, as of birds of prey, oh. people like hawks and buzzards and owls, and they come from an order of um, birds of prey called the raptores, people who sort of snatch things. Hi, Dennis Norton. Dennis, what is a pottle? P O double T L E, pottle. 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 Soppy word. <laughs> pottle. Well, it, it looks as though it could be um, a poodle whose mum had an affair with some cattle. Um, <laughs> I or it could be a small, a small pot. Yes. But then that would make. That'd be a potty. Well, now. <laughs> that would, on, on, that, on that logic, a bottle would be a small box. <laughs> um, which it isn't. <clears throat> it ties up with potty. Mm. Sort of okay. word connected with the old Shakespearean tavern, do you think? Yeah, yes, I think it's a thing. tankard yes. or something like that. Yes, you're getting nervous. Um, one and a half. It's a half of bitter. No, it's bigger it's a than quarter that. of bitter. <laughs> no, 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 you're going the wrong way. Oh. It's a former <laughs> measure of liquids, usually half a gallon, which oh. is rather a large big bitter. That's a lot um, of bitter, <laughs> yeah. Drink but it's a also a small wicker or chip basket you could use for strawberries, like a punnet. Right. Now, there's the two, one and a half. Well, before we begin round two, I give each team a quotation for them to write down, and the two women members of the team will, I hope, go on studying those quotations, because at the end of the programme, I shall ask them where the quotations come from. Um, Anne Scott James and Dennis Norton, your quotation is, The least said, soonest mended, and Tillis Powell and Frank Muir, yours is, I did but see her passing by. <laughs> Too early, Frank. Uh, and at the end of the program, I shall ask Dennis and Frank to give me their idea of how these came to be said or written. Well, then, round two is a round of odds and ends. Two marks for correct answers. Uh, Anne Scott James, what is a sob sister? Oh, well, it's a press or journalistic phrase for a female journalist who writes um, what's known as human stories. I thought you'd played that awfully straight, eh? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you get your two marks. Frank Muir, what is an Oxford frame? An Oxford frame? Mm. Oh, this is a... Uh, uh, ah. Well, um, <laughs> in the uh, uh, dates of medieval times, when ladies who did tapestry Petit point or gros point worked on a frame, and the, these frames were traditionally made from the yew trees, which would be found uh, in the village of Fame near Oxford, <laughs> and that's known as an Oxford frame. <laughs> <laughs> I can give you half a mark for sherry frontery. Um, Oxford frame is a picture frame so made that the wooden sides cross each other over at the corners and project for an inch or two. And a long time ago, I think, it was used for framing photographs of college groups and teams and things at Oxford and elsewhere. We don't see them quite so often nowadays. That's an Oxford frame. <laughs> Half a mark. Uh, Dennis Powell, what is known as Socratic irony? Socrates was always um, uh, telling a long story and asking questions mm -hmm. uh, which made his pupils admit to something which he was trying to teach them. Yes. 
Socratic irony means leading on your opponent in an argument by pretending that you're ignorant. And so he gets a bit overconfident and becomes confused and ties himself up in knots and therefore loses the argument at the end when Socrates finally delivers the knockout punch. Now, Dennis Norton, if the House, when referred to by politicians, means the House of Commons, what's referred to when the House is mentioned by A, members of Oxford University, B, financiers, and C, poverty-stricken chaps? Can I answer Three the questions. last... Three yeah. yes. <laughs> Can I answer the last part first? Yep. And the first part last... You can do whatever you like. In the middle, and then of the, in the middle, middle. In the middle. <laughs> <laughs> then I might take the first one again and come back to the last one. Uh, the house, uh, poverty-stricken people. Well, the house, by finances, is the stock exchange. Yep. Now, poverty-stricken people, I would say it has two meanings. Hmm. It's either the workhouse... Yes, that'll do. M members of Oxford University. I'd hope you forget the first one if I talk long enough <laughs> and pass <laughs> that. I, what is it? Oh, my... my uh, friend here who hangs around these places rather more than right? <laughs> says it's Christchurch. Absolutely right. <laughs> well, now we have a round of origins and derivations. Three marks if uh, members of team can define the present meaning, first of all, and then give me the origin and derivation of these words or expressions or phrases. And Scott James, it has the ring of truth. Well, it means it sounds true. Mm -hmm. Seems true to me. Mm -hmm. And I should think it comes from... Perhaps it means a coin, does it? Does yes. it come from a coin? Yes, you yes. sort of go... You know, you bite it between your teeth or you slam it on yes. a metal table. And, what and if it then? has the right sort of ring, it's the gold's OK. OK, that's jolly good. Well done. Three marks it is. <laughs> well, now, Frank Muir. The cobbler should stick to his last. Oh, it means a very much used expression nowadays. <laughs> it means you, you, um, you talk about what you know about and um, you stick to what you know. Yes, and <laughs> by origin. The cobbler should. <laughs> cobbler is the uh, last is a tool of a cobbler. So uh, when uh, somebody says. Um, Shoe my horse, <laughs> and the cobbler says it doesn't need. Oh no, man, isn't it? <laughs> man comes in and says I need a new pair of shoes, and he says, uh, and that suit doesn't look too pretty either. <laughs> he says, never mind the suit, just get on with the shoes, matey. Do you mind, squire? Very nearly, very nearly got there. Two out of three. What's wrong um, with three out of three? <laughs> <laughs> well. It means, uh, as Frank says, stick to the subject you know something about and don't interfere in matters which you don't know so much. But it comes from an original story of a Greek painter called Apelles, and he had painted somebody with shoe fastenings on his sandals, and a cobbler who came and had a look at the painting pointed out to the painter that he'd got it wrong. And the painter, Apelles, admitted this, and then the cobbler got a bit uh, conceited and said, well, I don't think the legs are right either. And Apelles replied, keep to your trade. You understand shoes better than I do. You don't understand legs or anatomy. Dennis Powell, he is a stickler for detail. A stickler for detail? Mm -hmm. Well, it means he's very, very careful about the smallest detail. Yes. A stickler. Comes from what? Where does stickler come from? I don't know, but he'd have a rotten explanation. <laughs> <laughs> Stickler. Mm. Painting? Having to do with painting? No, it doesn't. No. Doctor? No, not No, if, no. if you were uh, no. having a contest, um, a contest, somebody has to look after it. What, a kind of umpire? Mm -hmm. With a oh. whittled stick to keep the <laughs> score, is that it? Oh, uh, when you sort of mark it, mark it off on a... No, no I, I was trying to help you. Um, no, you, didn't, you didn't succeed, dear Jack. I think one and a half. Uh, a stickler for detail means somebody who's terribly particular and insists on or stands out for uh, all the details, even the most unimportant ones. You know that bit. Go on to the other That's right. <laughs> Sticklers were the people appointed as umpires in tournaments or wrestling matches or as seconds in a duel between two chaps. And they had to make certain that every particular point of punctilio and etiquette and fairness was observed. It comes from an old English word meaning to arrange or to regulate or to set in order. Stick that. One and a half. 
Dennis Norton, Middlesex. Ho, ho, ho. Play out time with this yeah. one. <laughs> Stick to my last. <laughs> <laughs> well, def definition of Middlesex. John Betjeman said it's a county that's strangled by its friend, London. Yes. Um, how did it come to how be called come Middlesex? Middlesex yes. yeah, interesting. Well, um, in the olden days, sex. <laughs> <coughs> it's so nice to be able to do this with a clear conscience. Cause sex doesn't, didn't mean what it means today. <laughs> it meant Saxon. Yes. So much for your Latin lovers, you yeah. see. The <laughs> original meaning of sex is Saxon. So mm. don't I tell you different. And there was Sussex, which is South Saxon, and Essex, which is East Saxon, and this is the clever bit, in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> Need I say more? <laughs> Brilliant. You're absolutely dead right and well done. <laughs> No, they lived in the middle between the East Saxons, the South Saxons, and the West Saxons, that is Essex, Sussex, and Wessex. Well, now we come to the last round and go back to those quotations I gave the two teams earlier in the programme. For two marks and Scott James, can you give me the origin of your quotation, least said, the soonest mended? Well, I should have thought it was just a proverb. Yes, I think it is. Traditional. Mm. I, I don't think, <laughs> I can't really fault you at that one. I think that is two marks. It turns up certainly as early as the 15th century, and then it comes in a play called The Shepherd's Hunting by George Wither in the 17th century, and it's also mentioned by Dickens in David Copperfield and in the Pickwick Papers, but originally in Caprava, too. Now, Dillis Powell, the origin of your quotation, which was, I did but see her passing by. Well, it's a song. Mm -hmm. There was a lady sweet and kind. Yes. Was never face so pleasing yeah. in her mind. I didn't see her passing oh. by, and I shall love her till I die. Absolutely right. Mm. <laughs> well, now I shall ask Dennis and Frank to give me their explanation of how these quotations came into being, and on this occasion the marks will go to whichever incredible explanation receives the longer applause from the audience here in the theatre. So, back to Dennis Norton and his quotation. Least said, the soonest mended. Well, I think I should explain about Mrs. Flora Treadgold, <laughs> because it, it was on these very grounds that she is suing her landlord. <laughs> she has a diamond necklace that is insured for four pounds. <laughs> That's the weight, not the <laughs> As you will gather, she is stinking rich and her great passion is houses. Each of them has some kind of very weird and way out feature, such as um, an indoor skiing slope. <laughs> but her latest one was one of the weirdest. She rang up and she said, you must come to my latest housewarming. We've got a sauna bath. <laughs> now, I didn't really know what a sauna bath was, you know, you sort of quiet around and people are rather vague about it and they say, well, it's, they have them in Scandinavia and they're very hot and you go inside and you roll about on the snow and they beat you with Twiggy, you know, it's... <laughs> <coughs> or, you know, it, it, something like that. Anyway, I turned up, you see, and it was a magnificent house and they got it very cheap, apparently, because of this sauna bath, you see the previous owner had died in it. <laughs> He'd apparently gone inside and got the temperature up to about 110 degrees and it was just about when he reached the consistency of a peeled shrimp. <laughs> Went to go out, found the door stuck. It was all, you know, sort of cooled my enthusiasm a bit, you know, for the whole idea. But she said, no, it's perfectly all right now because it's been repaired. The landlords have assured me it's perfectly all right. And my son, Walter, is going to sort of christen it officially in a minute. She said, come on, Walter, everybody's waiting for him. He was standing in that toweling robe, you know. And said, inside. And he said, oh, not alone, mother. And she said, what do you mean? He said, well, look, if we're going to have a sauna bath, he said, we must do it the right way, the way the Scandinavians do it. It should be mixed. 
Now, they've got this au pair girl. <laughs> you see, her name's Gia. Comes from Italy, and she's one of these girls, got this kind of figure, you know. She looks as though she never exhales. Do you know what I mean? And I, um... It was only then I realised she had one of these toweling bathrobes on as well. And you know, Mrs. Treadgold looked a bit sort of shocked. And Walter said, oh, don't be silly, Mother. You know, it's only be ten minutes, that's all. And we're both out. She said, no, all right. She said, both went inside. We stood about outside and sipping these, this champagne and eating little things on bits of toast, at each one of which cost the equivalent of a week's housekeeping. You know. <laughs> Ten minutes go by, 20 minutes, <laughs> half an hour, and she went, went a bit green, Mrs. Threadgold, after half an hour. She sort of tapped on the door and said, Are you all right, Walter? This kind of muffled voice came, in, came from in there. The door's jammed. <laughs> Consternation. Mrs. Threadgold all over the place, throwing her arms about. Walter's in there, alone, in there, with a naked Italian at 110 degrees. <laughs> about five of us got together and we barged at the door, you see. It didn't budge at all. An hour goes past, two hours. I, Walter, Walter, speak to my I'm all right, but Gia's fainted. What are you doing? I'm giving her the kiss of life. <laughs> Which he did, apparently, for about another three hours. <laughs> and then about four, the door just opened. And they both just sort of walked out. And I thought they looked in extraordinarily good spirits, considering their ordeal. <laughs> it's very strange, isn't it, the way people can come through things. Another very strange thing was that I noticed there was a key on the inside of the door. <laughs> which he put in his pocket. But I, I do, I do sympathise with Mrs. Treadgold about these sauna bath things. I think it was very wrong to have sold it to her under these conditions, and I'm with her in her suit against the landlord for the non-repair of her property. As she put it herself, the lease said the saunas mend it. <laughs> I don't know about the rest of you, I felt slightly cheated. Um, we go on Frank Muir, and if you remember, his quotation was, I did but see her passing by. One of the most beautiful lines, beautiful, beautiful lines ever written, I think. It was actually written by William Shakespeare. In the year 1590, young Shakespeare was an actor in London at the Curtain Theatre, living in digs and spending his evenings at the Mermaid Tavern. A bit quiet, you know, in those days, because the plague was coming on. It was about <laughs> three or four years to go before it struck. And, uh, but lots of people were, were feeling poorly and had the lurgy and were staying in. And he was alone, except a very, very thin, pale boy, visibly undernourished, came in through the door and warmed his thin hands at the fire. Very poorly dressed in ragged fustian, and on his feet, torn buskins, so old that they were really tramkins. <laughs> eh, Ludling, said Shakespeare, in his quaint but noticeable Warwickshire accent. <laughs> what doeth thee hither, if at all? <laughs> Sire, said the, said the starveling, Sire, I am a well-educated youth without place. I have no money. What's your name, son? He said, Bertram, sir. Bertram. Bertram Culpepper. Oh, I said, how do you eat then, Ladling? He said, well, I, I, I come into the taverns where the rich people eat, and sometimes they have lots of puddings, and if there's some sherry trifle which they don't consider good enough for them, I can snap it up and pop it in my mouth. I am, you might say, sir, a snapper-up of unconsidered trifles. <laughs> By X, said Shakespeare, that's a lovely line. He said, maybe, maybe, maybe you can help, lad. Can you think of a title? I've got this, um, 
this um, uh, Jewish gentleman, you see, he's a money lender, and uh, he's, this other friend, he's, 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 he's lent the money on this consignment of goods. The boy said, what, what sort of consignment of goods is it, sir? He said, well, 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 I'd say, you know, it's anything, doesn't matter to the plot, I'd say, um, gum arabic and uh, spirits and uh, um, Chinese lacquer. He said, why not call it, sir, the merchant of varnish? <laughs> By fullness, it is. He said, just, just one more, lad. He said, I've got this thing in the back. It's only a sort of thought at the moment at the back of my mind. This, this Danish gentleman, you see, he's got awful trouble at home and he, with, it, with his mother and, and his, his, his dad and his, his girlfriend. And he, he said, can't make up his mind, you know. And uh, he said, is he obviously a tragic figure, sir? He says, oh, I, oh, I. He said, he, he doesn't hide it. He parades his doubt. He wears it pinned on his arm, he does, like a, like a black armband of mourning. He said, then, my sir, why not call it simply armlet? By <laughs> 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 I will. He said, <laughs> he said, lad, I want to reward you. He said, you're obviously poorly, you're obviously underfed, I'd like to render you aid. Will you accept ninepence? <laughs> and so, Will Shakespeare went home. But you know, creative people are very extraordinary, and when you help a creative person, in order to conserve his ego, he has to pretend that, in fact, he has helped you. So when Shakespeare got back, he wrote in his diary, became beneficial tonight, benevolence overtook me, and... This young fella, uh, Bertram Culpepper, uh, I gave him money, and uh, he said, so I write in my diary, aided um, Bert C, a poor, thin boy. Now, that doesn't sound much of a line, does it? Because that's the line Shakespeare wrote. But set to music, it is a beautiful, beautiful line. Set to music, that comes out. Aided Bert C, a poor, thin boy. <laughs> By your vote, uh, Frank Muir wins the contest of the two stories, but nevertheless, uh, Anne Scott James and Dennis Norden win the entire contest by four marks, and that brings to an end this edition of My Word. In My Word, you heard Dillis Powell, Anne Scott James, Frank Muir and Dennis Norden, introduced by Jack Longland. The programme was devised by Tony Shryan and Edward J. Mason and presented by the BBC.